And I am I live? Yes. There we go. Any moment now, people people are waiting for it. And I wanted to pull this up too because there's a things to talk about and stuff to discuss. Welcome to Vlog Thursday, number two hundred and eighty-eight. Wow, that's a lot. Uh, <laughs> let's see. What are all the fun things we can talk about here? There's a couple things I wanted to bring up that I'll be talking about later. All right. Let's make sure I had all the tabs. Always that last minute to make this all happen. Hello from the land down under. I like saying that every time. It's funny to me from, you know, Australia being the land down under. For those of you that don't get the joke. Greetings from York. The original York, not the New York of America, but York. I imagine there's some relation there. We got Sacramento. All right. We got people local. Uh, Jay is Jay from Learn Linux TV. I believe that's where Scale is. Uh, big Linux conference. He's there this week, today. He's probably, I don't know if he flew there today or it starts today. I lost track of the details. Hello, Cody, my friend to the north. So Cody's in the uh, Canadian area, just a little above my head. This is a, uh, little north of, uh, of Michigan there. Nashville. All right. It's a good place. All kinds of people from all over the place. Oh, I think this is the furthest one yet. Pakistan. That's definitely a lot further away. Quebec. Not bad. Let's see. Charleston. Uh, De Charleston, South Carolina. Uh, Devon, UK. All right. Uh, best place for the edge router. I don't really use them. So not in my network would be my favorite place for the edge router. But if you want to use one, um, I mean, they work, they're fine. Uh, I don't think that they have the clearest roadmap at Unify on their life. I'd seen a few comments and I don't know like how well updated the edge router firmware is anymore. Um, let me look at the firmware hammer firmware history. Router firmware. Is it still frequently updated? Mm, yeah, it looks like there's still some firmware updates for it. We'll share the screen here. So we're on the same page, but uh, we don't really use them. And I don't, I don't have any particular true dislike for them, but yeah, they're, I don't know it. The, to me, they're not the most, the, the best solution out there. Why can't I see which tab this is? There's so many tabs. There it is. Well, oh, that's the search. There we go. Joey's working on making this easier to find all these things. So looks like there's still some firmware updates for it. So 718. Uh, eh, there's some, that's the edge switches. So let's look at like this one here. Is there a history I can look at? Was there an older firmware version or do I have to just do it this way? So yeah, 2014, 2014, 2022. So uh, yeah, there's not a ton of updates on it. I don't feel like it's a product that's getting a whole lot of love from Ubiquity. That's at least my feeling on it. Z Zurich, awesome. Zurich, Switzerland. We got Berlin, Germany. Winnipeg. I want to get a 4,100 for gigabit internet. Should I get a 5,100 for half the price instead? You know, the 5,100 is a solid device, but it is past end of life. I don't think they sell them anymore, um, but they're good. I mean, um, we pulled ours out and switched to the 6,100, but we were running a 5,100 up until two weeks ago. Uh, we just did it because we realized it was end of life. So we bought a pair of 6,100s because we always keep a spare um, sitting in a box. Uh, or sometimes more than one spare for our, our own stuff. But yeah, I don't, there's nothing wrong with the 5100. There's plenty of useful life in it. So end of sale is not really end of life is probably a better way I should describe that. Yeah, the 5100s aren't available anymore, but uh, I don't know that they're really end of life because it, the support life is really long because PF Sense doesn't spin, you know, specialized. We're only making 
uh, you know, software that'll work exclusively for this device. And now we're done compiling it. So you lose support. Um, they will keep supporting because you can really load PF Sense on a machine older than you should probably load PF Sense on and it'll probably work. It'll just have some speed issues. But the 5100, I would say, is still relevant. Um, so it, end of life is probably not the right way to put it. End of sale is a more accurate description. So end of sale, um, which it, uh, Cisco does a labeling similar. Cisco has like end of sale, then they have X number of time before it's end of support. I guess Microsoft does too. They support an operating system longer than they sell it. So um, yeah, it's just not sold anymore. So end of life is not the right term. Um, what are the things I want to get out of the way? One, I still do a lot of business content. The link down below is to business technicalities where we're posting all that business content. For those of you interested, I know some people are going, not my bag of tricks. I would just rather watch Tom talk about technical things. That's what this channel is for. But for those of you that are interested in the content we produce regarding business, hey, we're still uh, cranking out content over there on the business technicalities channel. So for those of you that want to subscribe, there's a link down below. But while it's at the beginning here in the first six minutes because not everybody watches to the end. And I understand that. And I did put something at the beginning here and it's something I'm going to have to change a little bit about my YouTube channel. Um, the it's aggravating dealing with the AdSense revenue and things like that and how that works inside of YouTube. Um, even Jay from Learn Linux TV, we, we've been many other YouTubers. We all discuss this because uh, I'm, I'm one of the last holdouts amongst my peers that have not, stuck a bunch of ads on the channel and I don't really want to stick a lot of ads on the channel. So I'm trying to figure out a better way to deal with sponsorships. And I think what I might do, and I'm, I'm asking the audience because you are the people who are the dedicated, join me on this Thursday adventure where we just kind of open forum, talk about things and uh, sponsorships. Uh, I, I'm thinking of doing it. And for those of you that don't know, like Risky Business Podcasts, I'm a big fan. Patrick Ray does a great job with that podcast. Uh, I've talked to him a few times, super nice person. And uh, I like the way he does sponsorships. And I think they're the most convenient way to not annoy the audience, which is uh, offering sponsors a couple pieces. One he does, he does sponsored episodes. So there's an episode sponsored by someone for um, a discussion on something. So it gives them an audience to put them on the channel. So I still do my full technical video with no ads, uh, other than an ad for myself, if you want to consider that an ad. Um, but then there's a sponsorship opportunity for the vendor to say, I want to sponsor a conversation with you. And it's fully disclosed up front. This is a sponsored conversation, which is what Patrick Gray does. And he calls them soapbox editions. He jokingly says it's all snake oil. It's these people paid to be here. He, you know, it's prefaced with that. And instead of having an ad that has to be watched all the time in all my other videos peppered around, it's a dedicated video that allows that person to talk. And of course, I'm not here to give them a platform to talk about how great their product is, but have a technical conversation about maybe, um, you know, I actually have a data center company that wants me to advertise, but cool. This is sponsored by XYZ or whatever the company's name is, data center company. Um, but then the conversation would be like, what goes on in data center? What can we talk about? Or some technical detail that may have some audience interest, but there'll be an awareness right up front that it's sponsored. And because I'm not peppering my um, videos with this uh, ad role as often, you know, technically we do have the home lab show is sponsored by Linode. And someone said, well, you always have to do that same Linode ad read at the beginning. I'm like, yes, we do. That's what sponsorships are. Uh, we have to keep the lights on and, you know, keep the content being produced. So yeah, I think it's kind of, um, where is, I, I always want to make sure it's clear and upfront. And, uh, I figure I get some audience feedback on that, some opinion. You can leave comments down below if you're not listening to this live and, uh, things like that. Just, it's just throwing it out there of following, um, yeah, Linus calls them showcases. That's the, I'm not the, certainly not my first idea. And Patrick Ray is not the first person to do that either with risk, with the risky business podcast. But um, yeah, I think it's just kind of a fun idea to have this and still not inconvenience. Now, granted, they won't give me, a, back uh, up again. Um, they won't uh, do this and sponsor me for as much, but that's okay. It's not like I'm trying to get the most sponsorship out of there. And I think it's just kind of a reasonable sponsorship. Um, the other thought I had was putting the ad at the end, which they won't pay as much for, but I think that's kind of an, might be another way to do it on, uh, when people specifically want to sponsor a tutorial. Cool. I'll open up a tutorial. This tutorial on blah, blah, blah is sponsored by blah, blah, blah. 
at the end of the video is their ad. Then I do the tutorial and my stuff's all time indexed. Uh, so you're still going to be able to go jump around between any of the sections that you want. Um, I even let you skip over my own little spiel of you could hire us type thing. So I mean, I, that may be some changes coming to the channel, but I always like people's opinion on this because ultimately, you know, I produce a lot of content for the people that consume the content, not just for myself and, uh, you know, just things like that. So stuff to throw out there and think about it. And uh, that's about it. So I, I hear some uh, good idea, Tom. I'm fine with sponsored videos, even 30 second ads. People don't like them. They can skip ahead. Well, unless you force them to unskippable ads and that's kind of what some of them are, but yeah, like I said, I just want to throw that out there, um, of trying to get some things on there because I need to fund some of the time, uh, and recoup some of it that's on there. So do it at the start. <laughs> And that's why I, I also have been trying to avoid, you know, the usual generic mattress ads and, and from some food ad, I could do those. Those companies reach out to me all the time, but I'd rather do something that's more relevant to the audience that I have. So yeah, sounds like a good balance to keep uh, financially stable, uh, end up not having to dictate too much uh, from what your content is. Yeah. And that's one thing I have a full content ethics policy and they cannot dictate my content. Matter of fact, when vendors send me things, they do not get to um, like get a preview copy or anything like that. Now, for example, in, uh, in my review process, I am working currently with Cisco to resolve how silly I find these devices and make sure all the problems I'm having with them are addressable. So, you know, in the review process right now, and this would be part of the review as well, and I'm very public about this, I found some bugs with these Cisco systems that I said, am I doing it wrong? You know, I'm not just going to say blatantly this device doesn't work as expected, but the problems I ran into, I'm waiting to see. Well, Cisco gave me some suggestions I got to try, some back and forth, but it's hung up the review because I don't know why these mesh extenders don't work with some laptops that I have. Uh, and, and, and it's kind of haphazard. They just don't connect. They get in a loop of authi authorizing. So, and then when I turn on WPA3, my uh, phone doesn't work, which doesn't make any sense because some phones work and some don't. Some laptops work, some don't, and I don't know why. Um, it's inconsistent. So, yeah. So it's just a matter of figuring all that out. Oh, if I can find a hot sauce place to sponsor me, that'd be great. <laughs> Would you keep the hire section? Yes, absolutely. Um, that is how people get in contact with us to hire us for projects. So that that isn't changing. Um, that part's, you know, it it's a balance because it's kind of like an ad, but at some point, is it enough? And this is a financial question. Is it enough for all the time I put into this? Would I, you know, do I want to keep doing this or something else that makes me more money? Well, I really want to keep doing videos. So I have to kind of fund the videos that does help fund them because it can bring a lead in that brings us a project that we can make money on. Yes. It's not the goal, but it's, it's a way to do it. And, uh, cause at the end of the day, this place I'm sitting in and all these cameras and lights and everything else has a cost and my time and effort I put into scripting, writing and all this has a cost to it. So, um, yeah, it's just one of those things. Uh, the mesh tube. <laughs> no, the mesh tube is still sitting in a box next to me. So there is the mesh tube. Uh, this is next on my review. I want to finish this Cisco thing because it's bugging me all the weird issues I had with it. So uh, as soon as I finish Cisco, I'm jumping into a bunch of Unify stuff. I wanted to give Cisco a chance. And I'm going to, I'm diving deep on this. Like the, there's paragraphs of details I have back and forth with Cisco. So um, I'm giving them absolutely because they're Cisco and they do make a product I think is reasonably priced. I want to make sure uh, my review of it is thorough, that I've tested all the angles. Um, so, so when I say what I like or don't like, it's going to be, um, you know, very, I want to be accurate and articulate about this device. And it's not that I'm saying you shouldn't buy it. You should be aware of exactly how it works, how it functions. Uh, so you can be an educated consumer and make a decision based on information I give, not necessarily buy this thing type of recommendation. So, uh, let's see. I would like to see some sponsored discussions, let them pay to have an interview with them. Uh, they get in to say what they want. Uh, you get to grill them about the product. Yes, that's a big piece of it. Um, that when we do these type of interviews, there's going to be some solid questions. Matter of fact, um, Okta, 
when they had their incident, they had a great interview, which I really recommend listening to if you want to understand what happened with Okta um, a few months back with the Lapsus and everything else. The interview by Risky Biz, one, it was sponsored. Two, Patrick laid into him and uh, really did a good job of making them say things in the interview, like getting out the truth and understanding of what happened, even though they paid to be there, I highly recommend listening to it. Like, Hey, cool. They sponsored, but uh, that was a solid interview with Okta talking about the details and how they messed up on their security disclosure of it. And uh, it was also interesting because um, just a little bit on that Okta topic, it's part of a playbook that you don't really have. You had a you had a threat actor making statements that were completely false and kind of faking as if they had more access than they did. So there was a lot of confusion in there and Okta didn't do a good job to get ahead of it to stop the confusion. But that Patrick K interview actually really clarified what actually happened uh, really well. And it's, it's not like because he went soft or they answered the questions. No, no, there was a lot of clarification in there um, that made a lot of sense. And a debrief is much better. So. Oh, Marie Sharps. Yes, that's a good hot sauce there. <laughs> Pizza ads. Yeah. I mean, the front, my, my thumbnail is kind of a Pringles ad. If anyone didn't see the uh, thumbnail I used <laughs> because I bought them, they're good. <laughs> Maybe it'll increase Pringles sales. Look at some of the Cisco 1000 stuff. It seems unobtainable. Um, I don't know what the status of stock is right now. That's a different problem. Um, these are the, the ones I'm reviewing are the Cisco 140 AC mesh units. Um, that's what I'm looking at right now. There's just, there's a lot to it. Um, and I'm kind of, of unraveling it all. I should have the review done soon. Hey, Lawrence, love the content. Uh, would you and Jay consider doing a podcast episode about getting into the IT industry career options? I'm six months into my IT career looking for a direction. You know, I need to, and Brett, I think might be listening. Hey, Brett, remind me to uh, reach out to uh, IT career questions. The uh, Zach, he's great, and I've been he's been wanting me to jump on there. He is more oriented towards talking about IT career path. Um, I'm not. It's a little challenging for me and Jay to talk about it, um, especially me. I've been unemployed for 20 years. Is kind of my joke. I mean, I may employ people, but I have not had to look for a company to employ me in 20 years. So it's a lot different. I have, I have a different perspective on it. And Zach, because he works in that field more, um, I have no problem contributing what I do know, but it's hard for me to put it into a structure because I've been unemployed for so long. <laughs> That's the uh, best way to, I can describe it. I'm more than willing to help people get employed. I just don't always know if I'm the best person to ask. Uh, you may have been asked this before. I recently finished the, how they got hacked. It was kind of curious if you ever considered, uh, new episodes. Absolutely. I'm actively engaging with some people uh, to try to get the band back together again. So yes, absolutely. Something I really want to do is uh, put that back together. It, the problem is the other folks, uh, Xavier and Mo have, uh, they're still working in cybersecurity. They just don't want to currently participate in the podcast due to work commitments and life commitments. And I said, that's fine. So that's why that's not happening. I didn't want to do it by myself. And I may spin it all back up with uh, some new friends that do have time to commit to it that work in cybersecurity. And sponsorships are fine as long as they are transparent. I absolutely love the transparency um, of all, anyone who is, and I would also participate in that transparency. Just bring more money to keep making great content. Yes. Have you used Netgear wireless access points? No. Uh, I have run in management land that doesn't access the internet trying to figure out uh, regarding firewalls to speed test and the firmware upgrade. Yeah, I have no idea. I've not used any of the stuff from there. Yeah, I seen Okta was in the news today. Um, I didn't see why. I seen people complaining about Okta, I should say, in the news. So that was <laughs> Cisco product stock. Uh, it's only it's all product stock, not just Cisco. So uh, we use Cisco at work and we always quote 12 to 18 months. There'll be time for switches. Yes. A lot of that stuff is very backdated, backordered right now. Uh, yep. Same with access points. Um, what is all about? There's a big lack of network equipment. I mean, understand EU, Russia. Uh, yeah. It's There's a huge lack of uh, equipment. It's just that the demands out is exceeding the pace at which the stuff can be built. Uh, ZFS re performance. Um, I believe Z2 is going to be better. 
I think um, it depends how you set up the mirrors. I have a whole video. If you look, there is a video where I break down all the performance metrics and you can look up the white paper from uh, TrueNAS on this. They've done all kinds of things on there. So your opinions as an employer might be useful to people getting an industry. Not really, because there's not enough small businesses and small businesses are dramatically different uh, than big businesses when it comes to hiring. And, and the reason why is because when you work for a small business, you just talk to the owner and you, uh, I, I fill seats based on needs. So I have a need for this and I find someone to help do this, but it's not the same as a large company. And that's mostly where people are going to cut their teeth is at the large companies. Cause there's just more, you know, there's any given moment, these large companies have like 200 openings and things like that. And, but by doing that, they have to have processes, vetting and part of that vetting process love it or hate it is usually what search do you have because that's the bar is this high to enter no oh, that's usually search they they're just like even if even if you're not really leveraging those search matter of fact a large company years ago i talked to her hr person and i was laughing i'm like why do you guys require uh, a bachelor's that says anything as opposed to computers and he goes well i figure if they've uh got a bachelor's in anything they've had to write a few papers and can articulate things and put them on paper. And even if it's, if they have a bachelor's in some random thing, but they come work here, it's helpful for us because we know they can write. And he goes, we have a few people working in our IT department that aren't really good communicators. And I'm like, Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. And what Corey said here is a problem. Global shortage of semiconductor. Asian chip fabs were shut down for an extended period of time during the pandemic and are still recovering from the backlog. Um, this is the downside of just-in-time delivery, which is, you know, I used to work in the transportation. I worked, used to manage IT. JIT is what we called it, basically. Um, when we would ship something from a Ford uh, facility or Ford supplier up here in Detroit, we would take it down to the Louisville stamping plant, um, mm -hmm. where they would build, I think the Ford truck was built there or still is. And we were delivering stuff that within hours of it, leaving the truck hours, not days, not weeks, it was being turned into a truck. The components start arriving. They start assembling. And this assembly process is followed in the, uh, chip manufacturers. So the semiconductor manufacturers not having a big backlog of things, causes this uh well, you know a little disruption in it there's there's not an easy way to catch up they just stay behind all the time uh would a video guess would it welcome a video and guess feeling unify ap cisco switch and pf sense vlan interface all tag correctly pf sense switch could not get to work not a favorable rule issue either confused um, I'm not really a Cisco guy. I mean, I do know how to put a VLAN on a Cisco, but that's probably where your problem is, if I had to guess. VLANs are easy on PFSense. VLANs are easy on Unify. Other manufacturers, I just did a review on an Ingenious. They, they don't even have documentation as to how to set their VLANs up. Their documentation is incomplete. I And I haven't checked to see if they fixed it, but I commented in my video that at the time of release of the video, and yes, I contacted them about this, they have incomplete documentation how to set up a VLAN. I do show you how to set up an ingenious VLAN. But, you know, and there's plenty of documentation I don't need to recreate on how to set up a Cisco v VLAN. But more than likely, if I had to guess on those three devices, your Cisco VLAN is the one that's not set up properly. So I have a video on how to do guest VLANs with um, PFSense and Unify. Um, you just insert how to set up, uh, you know, find one of the many, many videos and documentation how to set up a Cisco VLAN, and that'll answer that. Is Unify a good home system to have it all in one spot, or should I use PFSense instead of the Unify controller? Uh, it really comes down to your use case. I don't think that the firewalls are bad. They are just not as feature-rich in things like VPN uh, features. The VPN is probably the biggest reason that people don't like the Unify um, system, like the firewall system. It, it lacks a good VPN. Uh, that's usually around where the problems start coming in for people. There's some advanced things it can't do, but not every home user needs those advanced use cases. But VPN, common home user use case that uh, they just really fall short on with there. But if you want to, if you're just going, I just need internet. I don't care about VPN on my firewall. Well, awesome. It makes a good home system. Oh, love the videos you did with David Bumble specifically in relation to SCADA. Yeah, we did talk about that on the, I think it was on the Unify video. Um, or I'm sorry, the PF Sense video, we talked about that. 
Uh, what's the issue with advertising? YouTube's full of it. Creators should make money. Uh, users can always skip it or YouTube premium for non skippable. That's not the part I'm talking about. It's sponsored posts in addition. I'm not, the, the ads from the AdSense system are one thing, it's the additional sponsorships that I was mentioning in the beginning. Total agree regarding recruitment. I work for a big finance company and there are challenges regarding recruiting all the team. GIT works when everything's running fine. Oh, yes, it does. And what a disaster is it? I know from working in that industry that when a truck has a incident, there is actually a challenge that if that truck that can't make it to its delivery location for many reasons, potentially, uh, that can cause the shutdown of a plant. So, and then that actually delays the shipping of Ford trucks. Well, because I worked in a Ford supplier chain, and that means someone didn't get their truck on time. <laughs> Uh, or just late. I'm doing research and what I've seen the chips act, uh, just pass. It's too far down supply chain to make an impact until later, uh, than they pretend. Yeah. It takes a long time. Uh, building a fabrication plant. If I said, yes, I approve building a fabrication plant, um, down the street here in Detroit, there's a few years of building before that fabrication plant gets built. I was actually talking to a semiconductor manufacturer. I mean, they're 200 million into their facility, still building it not far from here. And it was just crazy. How about when uh, hiring expectations are 10 years experience in a five-year product? Oh, there's a bunch of dumb when it's on there too. So yes, there's, um, there's already uh, people. What is that new one? It's called um, coal. It's, it's a new programming language by Google, and there's already requests for people knowing a, a language just released. I've seen people, I don't know how true they are, but people joking about it. So, yes. Cisco is a trunk port, something on my PF Sense config. Yeah. Let's see. I only use Unify Access Points at Home Network and Firewall is open sense VM on a forbidden router. Yeah, I need to, I'm gonna do a follow-up video on the forbidden router thing. Um I, I was actually talking to Wendell about, about that. So I, I love that video, by the way. So I think it's pretty cool. I have PF Sense with TP Link and five VLANs all working together. Never uh, have got there without your videos. Awesome. Glad to hear that. Agree on the PF Sense over Unify Firewall more features, easier to configure my PF Sense. My biggest issue with my business that I place that I don't make enough dollars to hire someone even part-time in ideas how it with oh with my business is that I'm in this odd place where I don't make enough dollars to hire someone even part-time. You have to charge more. And I've talked about that before. Uh I have some backlog videos on this channel. I don't remember which one I mentioned it. I think it's called like building for growth or pricing pricing for growth. And it's the um problem a lot of people have when they start an IT business. And I I I people think I'm gatekeeping and I don't ever want to say I am, but I always ask, like, are you sure you should start a business? Because I hate my job as in a business plan. I'm not picking on you specifically, but a lot of people go, I'm just going to do it cheaper than the person I worked for. And then they realize that doesn't allow room for growth and all the expenses that you have as a business that allow you to hire people, give them benefits and everything else. Um, and keep the machine running. Uh, so it, it, you just have to raise prices. I mean, it is kind of a, you can only cut costs so far. A lot of times the only solution to you moving yourself to a spot where you can do it is to raise the prices. Also, you know, I, when I say I hate my job is not a business plan because I have a friend who makes really good money and he said, oh, I think I should start a business. I'm like, well, how are you going to generate leads? He has no idea. He just thinks owning a business would be cool. I'm like, dude, you make a lot of money. And if you don't like where you work, just go work somewhere else. There's a lot of places hiring today. So, you know, and it's no shame in that there's, you know, there's, I, it gets oversold that everyone needs to be an entrepreneur. And I'm like, you don't necessarily need to be, um, but you do need to work somewhere that doesn't suck. I will say that. <laughs> Thanks for having Seth with 45 drives, great technology and getting more people exposed. Yes. I thought that was a wonderful video. We're going to do some follow-ups on that too. That was on the home lab show, the whole Seth conversation with 45 drives. It was great. I learned a lot. And I went in there somewhat blind uh, so I could ask better questions because I was, I'm genuinely curious. And um, I, I'm going to work with the 45 drive scene to make a few more videos. And carbon was the word we're looking for. I want to say coal, but carbon. Google's got dumb names. I mean, we, we got Golang. At least we can call it Golang. But if you just say it's written in Go, like the game Go, the, the board game, like that's a, not an easy thing to do. Yeah. 
You're so right about documentation. These systems I set up in the military have full step-by-step -step docs from start to finish. My civilian job was a mess until it breaks. Yes. Yeah. It's, um, it's, it's getting there. In the military is about frameworks and process and procedure. Um, there's a lot of, I've always respected a lot of the people that came from the military for the process procedure they'll bring. When I meet people with military backgrounds combined with IT, they're often really good because they have a discipline, especially if they worked in a technological sector of IT for the military. Like if they had, uh, I don't, I forget what they call it, but the, um, what you were deployed as like your, your, the job you have as in a military, um, non-military person. So it's, um, it's eluding me at the moment. Um, is your job description there's a word for that you the military loves acronyms more than the tech <laughs> probably or even more so than the tech industry but yes it's pretty awesome uh when you get that discipline and you organize it and then you realize but you know if you were in the military your understanding is better than the average civilian i say average because there's some civilians that definitely get it um, of how these process procedures lead to a better outcome especially in tech The thing that's funny with Ubiquity Firewall is that I'm new and I can't tell the difference between when I'm screwing up or when it's screwing up. Uh, yeah, that's probably true too. I have to go, but I'm really going to cut your live stream. Thanks for all the great content. I hope you find a group to pick up on how they got hacked if you can. Definitely on my to-do list. Thank you for joining the live stream. Jaring leads and converting them is the big thing. Yes, most people uh, do not have a good process. I, I, it's like my first question for tech people because tech people frequently start businesses. This is across the MSP space. This is one of the reasons me and Sean uh, are doing that business technicalities channel link down below. If you want to subscribe to it, where we talk about business, but we talk a lot about the MSP journey and it people who start businesses are frequently people who just didn't really have a solid plan, but were very technically adept. That's why they're lacking on the marketing and sales side. They usually weren't sales guys who started a business. They were almost always 99% of the technical, uh, you know, companies are founded by technical people without a sales engine and they have enough clients because they were helping someone or they had some contacts to get those first clients enough to get them so far. But until they really build that marketing and sales and lead engine um, and put processes in place for it they just kind of, they hover, they don't really grow. They maybe grow a little bit. If they're lucky, they, they latched on to some clients that are growing too. Um, but that whole sales engine process was the hardest part I learned about my business, not the technical side. MOS, that's it. What's your MOS? I, I just know, um, I've heard that phrasing a lot. So, <laughs> uh, do you charge per hour per workday or fixed prices? Um, Block hours and contract is both of options that we have. So MOA, someone said. So military occupation specialty. MOS makes sense. Okay, so it was MOA was a typo. MOS sounds like I thought it was the right one. <laughs> Hourly and project. Yes, yeah, so you can charge for an outcome. We do charge for an outcome. That would be our wiring jobs are especially done that way um, because they're, there's a very tangible with a wiring job or a install of infrastructure. It's not installed. It's installed. You know how to get there. You quote it. You bid it. It's not done. There's no APs mounted on a ceiling. Now there's APs mounted on a ceiling. So the outcome is tangible. So you can put a tangible amount of money on that. You bid it. You go, it's going to cost you X dollars for these APs to be from on the floor to on the ceiling. But when you're dealing with, um, it's way harder to charge for not coming. You're dealing with like, all right, integrate this weird set of products that you have to tie into our network uh, and get the SQL server set up and get all these other stuff. Well, duh. unless it's something that we do day in, day out, like a common product, it's usually not, uh, you know, it's not like, Hey, how much to install QuickBooks? It's almost like how much to do this entire large integration. Then you have to just start charging block hours for things. Uh, do you recommend ST? Uh, do you recommend Better than gray log where you can see logs in a much cleaner way without spending half a year to set up all the things. What's STH? I don't know what STH is, so I don't... The answer might be no, but I, I'm not sure what STH is. 
Uh, after switching uh, from Zyxel to PFSense, I'm amazed how many things. The great documentation, one of them, biggest them. Uh, any chance you guys will get uh, OpenZia uh, from OpenZia interviews? Um, possibly. That might be a chance. Chris Roberts would be perfect for how they got hacked. I don't know that Chris Roberts has time. So, um, yeah. I, I, Chris Roberts would absolutely be perfect for how they got hacked. We weren't going <laughs> to think. But for those of you that don't know, and uh, I'll jump, I'll share this. I'm going to throw it in the links here. Oh, so, uh, da, 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 da. so much context switching that I got to do here. Don't worry, folks. I got gotcha. you. I have interviewed Chris Roberts. I threw the link in there. Um, Chris Roberts, very interesting hacker, uh, did a fun interview about getting into cybersecurity specifically. So this is a great interview. It was a few years ago. Uh, I posted it, Xavier hosted it. So this is from 2019, but yeah, great. Um, he's awesome. So if you, if you don't know, and of course, uh, the infamous Xavier, um, um and, and so, you know, he's also great cybersecurity guy, personal friend of mine. So yeah, check that video out. Uh, do you have a deployment for your gray log set, set from scratch? Um, or I, I will have them contact gray log and get a support contract. So a lot of times we're, um, we're doing things like, uh, you know, pushing clients towards some of the support contracts for things. And, you know, I, I understand like the question that was asked over here by RK, where did you ask it? Was it up here? This is one of those things like, do I recommend something else? Well, I love open source products. I like open source products with business models attached to them. And what I mean by business models attached to them is the fact that you can, um, whoops. <laughs> I, uh, we're going to do it right in a second here. Great log. I got to learn how to type. All right. So we can pull this up. But one of the things about Greylog is you have a support model that you can buy. And this is just one of those things like they have, you know, Greylog Security, Greylog Open, Greylog Operations, pricing. And you contact sales because it is custom to how you want to do it. Someone can be mad. And I like when things are publicly priced, but sometimes they're not. And if you want help setting it up, you just pay someone to set it up. That's kind of the business model. You can use it. It's open source, or you can contract Greylog to pay them to set it up and get things going for you. So that's one of the reasons um, that we like that tool a lot. So it's it's nice. You can do that if you want to use it for free, which is I like things that are very accessible to people in the home labs and stuff like that. Awesome. Uh, and that's the same thing with uh, XCPNG. So kind of similar. Here's XCPNG. And you're like, but Tom, it's not, you know, I need help or I want support or I need an SLA agreement, blah, blah, blah. All those things that you need for uh, corporate support. Well, you just change that dot org into a dot com. And uh, yeah, look, pricing. Look at this. Isn't that great? You can give them money for their uh, support. As simple as that. And you can buy it. And it's, you know, very clear. You can get the product, but here's the support contracts that come with it. So it's, this is how it works on there. Um, what VoIP solution are you pushing nowadays? No, back in the day, you're a big Reef Central fan. Years ago, I liked Reef Central. I won't lie. Um, I got away from them and I would be, uh, I would say right now, I mean, right now what we are technically are offering is VoIP services. We're a reseller for OIT VoIP. Um, so we kind of have a, our own branded solution internally. We're selling with it. You know, we don't want to deal with it. It's out back end is going to be my friend Ray at OIT. So they're awesome. Uh, yeah, great setup, great support, uh, easy to work with. And I don't have to deal with a lot you know, other than, you know, putting the sale, putting the process in place and uh, rolling out to our customers. Starting a tech business, I'm guessing it would be similar to applying for jobs at several companies uh, that don't necessarily have an open position. 
uh, drumming up business. Yeah. Uh, Graylog provides an example Docker compose file. That's as well, too. You can deploy Graylog with Docker as another way to do it. I have another open source recommended security model called Wazoo. Yeah, Wazoo's been around for a while. Um, it's just complex. It's been a while to see if it's become less complex, but I always found it to be a little... It's based on OSEC, and I learned OSEC before I learned Wazoo, and I liked it, but boy... I never did a video on it because it was just the cumbersome nature of it. Some of the complexities of dealing with it. Um, Wazoo is a fork, essentially. I can't tell if it's a fork or still based on OSEC. Uh, it's definitely more popular than its original form. Um, but there's still some a lot of complexities to it. Now, I know that since Elastic owns it, I think it's getting better. But yeah, that's the cha challenge with it is compared to the tools we use, um, it's not... Um, it's not as easy as like Sentinel one for security. Sentinel one just makes it way easier. That's where the challenge comes in. And there's really not an easy way to do this um, to make a direct comparison to Wazoo versus Sentinel one. You can look at the way they claim to do things, but Sentinel one is extremely, um, you know, just w in depth with what they do and considered quite good is as is Huntress and the way they do security monitoring. I don't know if Wazoo can really compare to the threat detection that they do, but that's a, a game of who's got the best dev team at the back end watching things. Um, I, you know, I trust the dev team at Huntress implicitly to be able to keep an eye on things and make sure things are good. I don't know how that works with uh, Wazoo. Um, I think they can do some custom API integrations. Uh, it's all IP phones. Yeah, it's all IP phone cloud-based. Uh, currently use free PBX for clients, but it's too much work to support. That's why we stopped. Right there, you nailed it. Currently, and I, I say we used to use free PBX for clients, but um, the support time is too much. It's It just became, I didn't have enough people to support that along with all the other network engineering we support. And it wasn't enough money though, to justify hiring a full-time free PBX person, which by the way, there's not a ton of free PBX people out there. If you, if you do, I know that's even been Chris's challenge. Chris from Crosstalk Solution has, um, you know, he's put out there a couple of times. He's trying to hire free PBX people and it's been, it's been a tough road to do. So definitely a challenge for sure. Uh, we'll attempt again and get Dr. Compose path installed before I spin a VM for Graylog. Yeah, Dr. Compose is definitely um, in the, the low-hanging fruit way to do it. Uh, on the Graylog topic, though, people ask, and I have a client asking this too, and people are talking about, you know, what do you log? And I'm like, well, log it all, um, provided you have storage and space to do so. Um, but I may do some alerting videos, and people uh, overcomplicate that. Um, you know, I, I alert on login for one. That's the like your low hanging fruit alerts we have um, that we just kind of like to put in. We, I want to be notified if someone logs into something, especially when it's something that doesn't have regular logins, like SSH logins to all kinds of things. Uh, it's if someone SSHs into any of our servers, which pretty much is only me um, or if one of my staff, if there's some problem, which it rarely is because all of our servers, our Linux servers are all automatic upgrade, unattended upgrades. They're just doing their thing. Uh, so they're not like we need to log into them very often. Our PF sense, we have a notification that comes through if someone logs into PF sense. Simple. Because why would they log into PF sense? You know, well, there's a reason they need to make a change. That's fine. There's not a reason for me ever to not be alerted of such things. And uh, it, it's one of those things when you're parsing stuff in in gray log and we'll go ahead to go to the alerts. Um, I can share these on the screen. Hold on. Let me make sure. I got to make sure because I, I don't want our alert where our alerts get sent to be public. Uh, let me pull up one of them. Yeah, there's no email address in here. So I'll just share it real quick. Boop. So when you're looking at the alerts, it's just really simple of if someone logs into my invoice ninja, SSH, send me a notice because they shouldn't be logging in unless there's a 
adjustment or thing to be made. So you just set up an event. I was logging because I, I was doing something today. So there's the log of it. It's really simple um, how a lot of that works. And you can also say failed login attempts, you know, another good thing to alert on because no one in my internal infrastructure should ever fail to log in. So really any login attempts um, are what you kind of want to alert on. And people ask this question a lot. Let me find the PF Sense one. Because there's an assumption that you have to structure the data and put it into something in order to get it to work. And you don't at all. Um, let me zoom in real big here to make it look. You can do a search query like this. And I'll bring it back up. You can do search queries inside of here, such as index PHP colon successful login. You don't have to know the field that that went into. You don't have to structure that piece of data into a field to parse it, to trigger it. You do need to filter and index and parse that into a field if you want to grab that data and integrate it with something else. But if you just want to know when index PHP um, also has a successful login statement, well, then you just pull that and send it as an alert and a story. And uh, so I'll, I'll probably do some alert videos coming up. Um, on gray log, but they're that simple. You don't have to structure because someone I, and more than one person has contacted me or comments they've sent in the forums. Well, don't you have to put structure and parse all the data out in order to alert on it? I'm like, not really. You just send me the log containing this. Is it formatted pretty? No. Does it need to be? No. I can see the data that's in there. It tells me the username that logged in, the time they logged in. I mean, if I wanted to aggregate and make a summary of the data, yes, I would have to parse it and uh, put it in some fields, but I don't care to because I don't have a use case for that. <laughs> you know, there's a lot of simplicity to when you do this gray log stuff. It makes it so much easier. Um, do you uh, also are redirected to the community page from gray log after clipping marketplace? I can't find any official extractors. Um I don't know. Just Google, Google search for gray log extractors. They're usually on GitHub. Um, let me look at the gray log. Let's see, is there ICT or gray log? X I guess what I usually look for extractors based on. Um, yeah, I mostly find GitHub stuff. That's usually why I get them. If you go into the forum, they have like a forum where you can find some of them as too for the gray log extractors. So there's, they can be found places, but you can write your own. They're just written. I hate regex. I'm not good at it. So. Biggest problem with alerting on failed login is you find it who cannot type. Well, and for us, we use password managers, so no one better be typing in these things. I'll find out who's trying to type. That's then that's the bigger issue. <laughs> Ooh, great log. So Veronica's looked at it too. I bet Veronica knows regex though. If I had to guess, she's probably better at regex than me. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Answer in the comments below. <laughs> uh, thank you for your videos. Running PF Sense is a SIM bridging service uh, for two years. Awesome. Setting up PF Sense remotely via WAN. Um, I just you know restrict it to your IP address. That's one way to do it. Uh, tail scale, complete another way to do it. Um, tail scale is really cool. It gives you option. You can administer it over tail scale. Um, there's another option. So those are a couple different ways you can do it. But opening up a firewall port and restricting it to a management IP that you, you know, static IP that you have access to, that's a popular way to do that. I once got an argument with a CTO about the necessity uh, for logging logins. They aren't to see, yeah, you shouldn't have had an argument with that person. They should have just understood. A video about sidecar log collector filters would be great. I always question if I have it set up the best way or not. They have videos that Graylog has put out. I would actually reference those because I haven't used a sidecar at all. So um, I I did the videos before Graylog had videos. 
Then Craylog started putting out some more videos. I reached out to the person doing videos. He said, let's do some videos together. I said, great. When do you want to do them? And I'm waiting on a reply. <laughs> um, so if Craylog watches this, hey, I'm over here. Um, I don't mind doing some video. Horrible at regex, but good at COBOL. <laughs> If you don't know, Veronica Explains has a YouTube channel, so uh, go look and check out the great videos that she has done. Like and subscribe over there. Uh, lots of fun stuff. She's uh, among us fellow YouTube geeks. We have we have behind the scenes. There's a, uh, a persistent communication going on. That's why you see people like me and Veronica and Jay and Jeff Kierling and Jeff from Craft Computing and. Uh, Lots of other people, Chris from Crosstalk. We we do chat with each other uh, about YouTube and about content creation, and uh, we occasionally collab with each other, including people like Wendell as well. So yes, all the stuff in the Graylog marketplace that I've is uh, for older versions of Graylog. Yeah, problems importing extractors. Yeah, that's a big dent. Hi, Tom. Do you ever write PowerShell scripts? Um, the best PowerShell scripts are from Kelvin. So I'm going to give a shout out to my friend who writes this stuff. Um, I am not the PowerShell person, but he is. So CyberDrain, Kelvin, uh, I, I know him by his real name, but CyberDrain has a lot of solid uh, scripts that help techies manage things. Lots of stuff. It's all free. Uh, he's I believe he's got all this on a GitHub as well. So, yes, uh, you can sponsor some of the stuff on there. But, yeah, lots of things that uh, he's a busy he's a busy person uh, dropping a lot of code. By the way, he works for a large IT uh, managed service provider. So uh, his code is very actionable and useful to other service providers because as he solves problems, he dumps it out on GitHub so you can enjoy the solving the problem together. Every time I write regex, I end up on the grep man page uh, open. Yep, pretty much. Been trying to get the opening port thing to work, but it's sorting me. Currently trying to uh, do it with primary LAN as LAN web source. Um, I don't know. Usually I go to WAN, I open a port, and you open a port to the firewall self. So I'm not exactly sure what, what you're doing wrong. Hey, no problem, Veronica. Agreed. CyberDrain is solid and full of content. Yes. And I, 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 I'm in some chat groups with Calvin. He's great. Um, just good person to know, good person to uh, be able to ask questions. You know, Calvin actually started something. Um, was it one of his projects here? It would have been with, uh, what was that called? One of them, see if it's in here. I thought it was in here. Maybe it's on his Cyber Dream blog. Why isn't it typing? Reload this page. There we go. Weird. Uh, here we go. PowerShell for creating network maps. Uh, this is something it started and there's still more that can be done with it, but it's basically um, unify PowerShell module. Uh, module, a friend of mine asked me, and I'm that friend uh, because it's a pretty awesome project. And this is just kind of neat. It's uh, he does have a uh, okay, maybe this person was where it started. There's a few, there's some cool stuff, anyways. Um, uh, you can find all this on there. It's uh, it's pretty neat. Lots of lots of learning to do. At least I know it's not you big screwing up this time. It's actually primary land is UDM Pro. So yeah. Uh, do make sure you're not blocking Bogon networks on LAN because that will cause uh, you if if you're coming from a non-public IP address and by default I believe 
the default option is checked to block um, RFC 1918 networks. So you want to make sure those are not uh, blocked. There's no comparing BIOS and PFSense. The, that's not that's not even a, an apple to oranges um, comparison. So, yeah, it's they're very different products. Not likely. I don't use BIOS, so I'm not likely to review it. Also, BIOS is not the same as um, PFSense at all. I know they're working on a web interface for it. I have no idea the status of it. Because before, it didn't even have a web GUI. Uh, I still don't see one. I don't know this. So this is the, what appears to be the most recent update for it. I don't know. Not something I've used, but it looks like someone's working on uh, making a web GUI. So it's completely command line driven and they're working on a web UI. PFSense is not very command line driven, but has a really extensive web UI that lets you do everything. That's why they're not, when it comes to usability, in learning curve, PFSense has a lower bar of entry compared to Vios. I don't even know if Vios has all the same features, but because Vios is Linux, technically, if there's a feature you can't find, you can usually throw it back in there. Um, so, yeah, there's that. So I wouldn't say that they're the same. All right. What else did I have in my list here? I think I may have reached the end of all this stuff. We've got to the errata. What does Tom do? Um, I thought about doing a video about that because I had a fun conversation with someone the other day asking what I do now. And I'm like, well, I make sure all my staff is um, paid and make sure they have all the things and tools they need to do their job and uh, meet with customers and all kinds of fun stuff like that. But um, I don't know where the interest level is in a lot of that. It was an interesting conversation because it makes me think a little bit more critically about what my tasks are, which a lot of them center around, you know, enabling my staff because I'm the anti micromanager. I don't want to micromanage things. I want my staff to bring questions to me and then me put a process in place so that question doesn't come up again <laughs> in, in back to me. I want them to be able to have the authority, the means and the tools to get something done. So that is a big thing of what Tom does. As he works. <laughs> um, yeah, the, the micromanaging of stuff is in there. Oh, now I know what I'm talking about. This will be the final thing before I wander off here. Uh, this is always the scary stuff is where did that go? Where did it go? Oh, did I remove it? Is the post removed? Huh. I'm not seeing it. Oh, here we go. I just was overlooking it. There's not a lot of data on this yet. It's in Bleeping Computer. Um, there's just not a lot to talk about just yet. And this is a uh, managed service provider called um, Net Standard in Kansas City. He announced this morning their host environment was hit by a cyber attack. And of course, all the discussion down below about it. And I can throw a link in here for that, but it's easy enough to find. Um, but yeah, this is a, a you know one of those things that happen a lot, and it didn't take long for me to. And I don't know what happened. We're very speculating here, um, but one of the things I noticed at this particular uh, place was well, had a lot of uh, things publicly exposed, and because they had so many things publicly exposed, it, it made you wonder a lot how they got hit if they were hit from their public exposures or not. And uh, it's just those things that it, it's scary as an IT service provider and why we do so much internal auditing. Um, and it never feels like enough because getting attacked is just, yeah, just bad. You know what I mean? Just a lot of problem. So, and then they did have stuff in Shodan. Um, yeah, just so much stuff. It was it was kind of a mess. And to go further to talk about this as a topic, we don't know if this is related or not, but let's talk about this. Um, this was a uh, public post on LinkedIn 
And basically, and let me jump. So uh, open an image, a new tab. There we go. Oh, this is the interpreted version, but this was someone selling access. Can I zoom it in here? Yeah, there we go. Access to the MSP panel, 50 companies, more than 100 ESXi and 1,000 servers. All corps are American and are prospering in the same time zone. I want to work qualitatively. I don't have enough hands. In terms of preparation, there are little things left, so my percentage of profit will definitely be high for details and suggestions, private message. What you're looking at is what they refer to as an initial access broker selling access to an MSP. Now, we don't know if this was that company or not, but this came about... 48 hours before that company became attacked and someone posting in a forum and in basically, you know, a, a dark web forum saying, yes, I've gained access. Who wants to help me ransomware this company? And this is how they sell. This is a public view of how they sell um, access. They're referred to as initial access brokers. And this is how it happens. So, yeah, it's just a mess. Um, uh, Do you, oh, do you accept new contracts? Even the staff is already 100% booked. Maybe make sure you have enough work if all client, if a client quits relationship. Um, we, we tell people like someone needed a wiring job done. We say, yes, but are you okay with it happening on this date in two weeks, three weeks in the future, whatever it is. That's just how we're very honest with any of uh, the people. We don't accept things we can't do because that would be stupid. Um, I, probably you're right. There's someone out there doing that. I don't doubt, but that's a, um, not something or a practice we participate in. We will only accept things we can do. And we're always, always clear up front when we will do those things. Someone tells us they want something done. Great. We're going to put a time schedule on it because you don't want to take on things and, and start off at a bad foot in a bad relationship with a client. So hopefully that makes sense there. Just to clarify, I want to remove firewall rules for RC19 networks, then uncheck those boxes. There's just a couple of boxes on, on the WAN that you uncheck for that. But nonetheless, uh, I'll leave you with that. That Kansas City incident um, is interesting. The fact that someone, it seems very coincidental, was... Uh, having access. So yeah, it's a mess. That whole thing is a mess. It is a big challenge and a big worry of anyone running an IT business and goes back to that. Do you really want to start an IT business and be a target? <laughs> that part sucks. <laughs> and I think that's it I have for today, folks. I'm going to go wander around and do something different now. And uh, that's about it. Anything, any last questions in the last couple minutes here? I don't, I'll give you guys a couple more minutes to see any more questions or smash that like button. Cause I do see 130 people, 132 people and not 132 likes. <laughs> Business is hard. Yeah. It's complicated and confusing. Hey, talk to you later, Travis. So smash that like button. Absolutely. So you can get a few more likes before I leave. Can I share that screen? What if I did this? If I went and did this and I put it here and then did this, you guys can see the likes. And now I got to zoom in. 129 people, 62, 64. Let's get those likes up there before I leave. <laughs> they're, they're going up. We got to get it to the internet funny number, man. We're two away to an internet funny number. So two more likes. <laughs> Come on. 68. Come on. One more. <laughs> Got to reach an internet funny number. All right. Cool. We pass it. Thank you very much, everyone. <laughs> I, I should suggest that, you know, more throughout the series as we do it. But hey, why not? 70. Damn. 76 uh, right now is what I'm reading. So awesome. 
Well, as always, thanks to everyone who joined. Uh, see you in the forums is an easy way to communicate with me, sometimes on Twitter as well. Uh, Twitter's not for tech support. Twitter's places to say hi. Forums are for tech support. So I do spend a lot of time answering questions in air. So if you're looking for something more complex, so uh, awesome. And glad to see all of you here. Oh, and uh, who else was in here? I see someone else. Oh, yeah. Thank you also, Veronica, for joining. So. Hey, have a great evening. Have a great night. I'll see you in the in the chat where we usually chat. We have our little YouTuber group where we chat with everything behind the scenes. So thanks, everyone, and uh, take care.